1 Samuel chapter 14. Tonight, and I don't want to show a hands, but in your heart, how many of you are fearful? Right? Not a show of hands. We're not trying to out you. But how many are, you know, you just heart check. You're fearful. Afraid of getting sick. Afraid of dying. That's the one I'll never understand, but okay. Afraid of dying. Like, where you're headed is worse than this place. Come on. Right? A fear of losing your job. Or your homes, right? Or your health. You're in a wheelchair. Fear. Fear of the unknown, that can be crippling. Tonight we're going to look at faith over fear. And I believe 1 Samuel lays it out perfectly. We're going to be we were introduced already. We're going to be super introduced tonight to Jonathan, Saul's son, who is a man of character. He is a man of uh, bravado. He is a man that takes God at his word and refuses to fear. Now, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have fear from time to time, right? God knows what we're made of. He knows that we can fear that's okay you walk under a, a cliff and there's a big boulder and it's like starting to shake you should be concerned at least otherwise there's something completely wrong with you right because my fear would be not that the boulder would fall and kill me but that the boulder would fall and i would still be alive you know what i mean <clears throat> all jacked up on the floor yeah you know uh-uh uh-uh take me out so, but we all deal with fear. The psalmist wrote, Lord, for when I am afraid, I will trust in you. So the problem isn't being afraid. It's what do you do with it? And why do you fear? Does God not have you? Will God not protect you and lead you? Because, listen, not because I'm telling you but because his word promised it. The promises of God. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah, but things are so tough right now. I can't find a job, which I don't think anybody can say that anymore, right? I mean, there's jobs everywhere. So I don't think that's a problem. But for some, it might be. Maybe you need a, a high-skilled, high-paying job, and they're hard to come by. You know, maybe you're, you're trying to sell your house. And you've heard these stories of everybody selling their house for $7 million and I can't, find, I can't find a buyer. Maybe you're on the flip side. You sold your house and you can't find another one. Maybe the market is so out of, out of hand that you're like, are you kidding me? What is happening in this market? Well, the world has gone mad. And I think that we, we realize that. So in a world that's gone mad, it's easy to be fearful. Right? There are giants in that field. Right? The unknown. Things that want to hurt you in the night. So we think. And, and believe me, believe me, everybody has that dream of someone breaking into their house in the middle of the night and you're fearful of it. Can I tell you from someone who formerly was on the other side of that? The worst thing is to try to break into a home not knowing what's waiting for you. That's the greater fear. And man, at 15 years old and being dared to do it, highly stupid, um, but man, it strikes the fear of God into a person. So all kinds of fears. Tonight, we're going to look at a man who should have been afraid, should have been con concerned, and yet, I believe that he rests upon what he knows of his God he falls upon the word of God, which we should always do, and he finds his strength. Would you join me there as we pray? Father, we have 1 Samuel chapter 14 open to us tonight, Lord. And Lord, I believe there's a lot for us to glean from this, Lord. 
And I pray, Lord, that if, if we have those folks, Lord, maybe here in the sanctuary or online who are fearful, Lord, that tonight you would convert them into giants of faith, God. We know that faith is a gift that comes from you. Lord, it's simply your grace. But Lord, we're asking for that measure of grace. Bless your people, Lord. Bless this night. Bless those watching online from around the world, around the United States, Lord. We're, we're honored that they would spend uh, time with us, Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus. Bless this time, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Verse chapter 14, now it happened. One day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, his, his armor bearer, now that's not like a, uh, a golf caddy. Some people have the idea like the armor bearer just carries his armor around all day long like a caddy. It's not what they do. Um, they're warriors. They just happen to carry extra swords, uh, the armor that he would wear, the, the coat of mail, if you will, um, they do that. So generally, an armor bearer is not like what we think in our head, some little kid carrying stuff. No, usually it's this big, massive dude that can. Um, he usually carries out the task of inflicting the heavy punishment after the initial blow in battle. That's his armor bearer. He says, come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison, garrison that is on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. And I pause. What's that? Well, we just read in the chapter before that the Philistine garrison is more, is numerous, numerous people, more than the sand on the seashore. And they're looking out at this group. It's Jonathan and his armor bearer. And he says, let's go over to the Philistines. Like, um, why? Why would you do something like that? Well, the reason is the Philistines are on Israel's territory, their property. They have no business being there. Jonathan is offended that they would even approach. But he doesn't tell his father. Why? Well, I think that we already see Saul's character, don't we? He's a man of leisure. He's a man of luxury. He's a man that doesn't really want to get caught up in the battle. He's a guy that wants to be uh, paraded around, loved on. He wants the, the people to, oh, he's wonderful. But mix it up? No, I don't want to do that. Verse 2 says, And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree. God thinks it's necessary for us to know what kind of tree he sat under. All right? Why? Because that's a very leafy tree. There's a whole lot of shade. That's what Saul's caring about, and the Holy Spirit wants us to know that. Listen, which is in Migron. This is a man with no faith. This is not a man who wants to go into battle. He already took credit for the battle that his son Jonathan fired up and really won and pushed back the Philistines. He took credit for that already in the previous chapter. Now he's under the tree, and it's like Jonathan's looking at his dad under the pomegranate tree and going, seriously? God's enemies are right over there? And you think it's necessary to be resting right now? Waiting for them to bring the battle to us? The people who were with him were about 600. Remember, he had a huge army. Most of them went home. <laughs> it says here that um, Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Lord have mercy, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. Again, this is the, the broken, rejected line of Eli that has been cut off uh, from serving the Lord. Uh, it's that Ahijah. He was, uh, he's wearing an ephod, right, to interact with the Lord, to hear from the Lord. He's the high priest now uh, bringing their spiritual covering. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. 
The idea is he's on a quiet mission. Had the people know that Jonathan, the son of the king, went out to battle, they would have all gone. Well, Jonathan doesn't want to be responsible for these men because they may not have the heart of a warrior that he has. He's not worried about laying down his life. In fact, he knows that God will be with him. God is stirring this hunger in his heart. This anger is being stirred up in his heart by God. Again, anger is not the issue. What you do with the anger is. Jonathan right now is on a, uh, on a quest <laughs> to rid uh, Israeli land, Israel, uh, from these uh, monsters, the Philistines, an angry, evil people, uh, God-haters. They were uh, worshipers of Baal and Molech, and uh, they were a disgrace in Israel. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side, and a sharp rock on the other side. The name of one was Bozes, uh, which in the original language means uh, shining piece. So I would believe that this is where the sun comes up and shines on this rock. I'm going to take that shot at it. And the name of the other is Sene, uh, which means um, rough terrain. <clears throat> now, I love that we can always prove out the Bible, and you can do just some Google Earth stuff, and then you can put like little images over top. Um, check this out. Bring this up with, uh, for me, please. This is the area that we're talking about right here. Um, and then let me get the overlay of the land. There you go. That's the valley that he's talking about. You got a rock that gets shined on, and the other one that is uh, like a crag, a sharp crag they're going to have to come from one area down into this valley and up to the other now draw your attention back to scripture it says uh the front of one faced northward opposite micmash and the other southward opposite gibeah then jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor come let us go over to the garrison of the uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. John gets it, man. Jonathan, he gets it. And listen to me. This should be underlined in everybody's Bible. Oh, I don't write in my Bible. It's too holy. Yeesh. Get a Bible you can write in. It's important to take notes. This one should be highlighted. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. By many or by few. A Billy Graham crusade or in the living room. The Lord is out to save. More saving, more doing, right? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> verse 7, I love verse 7. So his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. <clears throat> I love that, man. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're stepping out in faith. They're stepping out believing what God wants to do here. And I believe that they're looking at, look at a couple of scriptures with me, if you would, please. Uh, let's go to Leviticus. We can bring this up on the screen. You don't have to go there. Look at what Leviticus says. And I believe he knows this. You will chase your enemies and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put <clears throat> 10,000 to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. <clears throat> that is amazing. Because Jonathan's going, all right, five to a hundred, um, there's two of us, and I'm seeing about 20 of them over there. Now listen, they send out a detachment of the Philistines. That detachment, now, 
tries to make further progress into uh, Israeli area, seeing how much more they can take. So they send out a detachment of about 20 men. That's who they're looking at. These 20 men. But there's two of them. That's going to be a heck of a fight. But listen, again, I think he's looking at the word Deuteronomy 28. We'll put it on the screen. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. What's that? Yeah, as soon as they see what's going down, they're going to run for the hills and they're not worried about which way they retreat. They're going every which way. It's a promise from the Lord. Listen, when you have a promise from the Lord, act on it. Run with it. You're not being presumptuous. You're acting on the word of the Lord. God will not let you down. Amen. This is the thing that we need to get from here to here. Yeah. Needs to move about 12 inches. Because we read this stuff and we go, that's right, God will never let us down. Then the heart starts to speak, which is wickedly deceitful above all things. Listen, the heart starts saying, yeah, but that's for the other people, not for me. God will let me down. He'll, he'll make me look stupid because I'm in sin. Or I sinned back in the third grade. He's still holding it against me. You know, we come up with all kinds of ideas. Not my God. I don't know what God you're serving, but not my God. My God, listen, he won't break his word. Will not break his word. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my word? Eh -eh. Mike Burner vernacular. So his armor bearer said to him, do what's in your heart. Go then, here I am with you, according to your heart. That's a lion's heart right there. Yeah. Then Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. In other words, we're going to go pick a fight. <laughs> if they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. In other words, we might take a beating. But if they say, come up to us, then we'll go up for the Lord has delivered them into our hand and this will be a sign to us. Now, we don't have this in scripture, but I wonder if his armor bearer goes, all right, uh, and what's next? No, that's it. That's your plan? They come to us, we take a beating, we go to them, we fight because God's with us? All right. And that's what happens. And they get their attention, these 20-some-odd men. They show themselves. And how do they show themselves? Hey, you bunch of pigs. You uncircumcised. You're a bunch of punks. Let's read. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes which they have hidden. Remember, all of Israel was afraid. We, we talked about Saddam uh, uh, insane, going into a hole, right? That's what they do back in there. When you're afraid, you, you hide. So they're making fun of them, thinking that they just came out of some hole and hiding from somewhere. But look. The Hebrews are coming out of their holes, verse 12. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we'll show you something. <laughs> Holy Spirit really cleaned this up, right? Oh, yeah? Come on. And Jonathan, that's the sign he's waiting for. Why? these punks are too lazy to come and chase us down, we're going to get them. God has delivered them into our hand. Those verses that I told you about in Leviticus, they're coming true, and it's for us, for today, for right now. The Lord has spoken. Oh, man, how many of us need to approach life that way? 
How many of us need to approach life that way? Those of you watching online, that's how we need to approach life. With the faith of the Word of God. Man, when we go in faith, fear can't stand. Fear has no place in the, in the face of faith. I like that. Now listen. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. It's clobbering time. Remember the thing? So listen, this is either the Lord or this is lunacy. We'll find out. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and on his knees with his armor bearer after him. Now, now what's that? What's going on? It's a rough terrain. He can't just walk up. He's got to do like a crab walk up the side of this hill. You know how exhausted you are? Those of you that played football and they made you do crabs across the field, by the time you do one across the, the uh, just going across the field, you get to the other side, you're like, ah, kill me, kill me. This guy's doing it up the side of a mountain and then he's supposed to fight. Now listen. And they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. The slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about a half an acre of land. <clears throat> I don't know why that's important, but the Holy Spirit wants us to know, hey, you know that, like that little area there in front of the church, that half acre land there? That's how many of the 20, they died in that little area. And it looks like Jonathan is coming up and, and he's taking a spear out and he's just dagging people. You know, maybe a knife in each hand. He's fighting, he's dagging, he's dagging, he's dagging. And his armor bearer is coming up and going, that looks like it hurts. <laughs> Next guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is a bloody, bloody scene. They killed 20 men within a half an acre. Which means there was a whole bunch of Philistines in skirts running and got caught. Because it's kind of hard to kill 20 men in a half an acre. They got to be on foot. They must have saw the slaughter and said, I'm out of here. And Jonathan said, I don't think so. This only happens when God is with you. Now, maybe that's too gory for some of you. It was written for me, though. I, I appreciate this, man. I hate, I hate cowards. I hate cowards. I hate men that run from a fight. And I don't mean a fist fight. I don't, I don't do fist fights. I, I don't do that. That's my past. I mean a spiritual battle. You know, your, your family is, is basically lying in ruin. And instead of just watching it happen, how about fighting? How about fighting all of hell? If God is for you, who can be against you? How about taking your family back? How about saying, no, 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 listen, sit your butts down, tonight we pray. <laughs> I don't like it when dad does that. Tough. Tonight we pray. Tonight you will bow a knee. Tonight you will bow your heads. Because everything that we have comes from the Lord above. Tonight, we will not let Satan into this home. Tonight, we shut it down. And, and you take back just valuable, the most valuable land that you could possibly ever have. Man, and if it's your own walk, man, when do you sacrifice the garbage in your life and just get rid of it you know for some of you it like me it was music and and man you remember that the cd clubs any of you old enough to remember that right it was a penny i'll send you 17 cds you send me a penny what 
How many of those things did I fill out? How many different aliases? And it's like, I put my address and I put apartment A. I changed my name, I put apartment B. I changed my name, I put apartment C. By the end of a month, I had like 190 CDs. Music I didn't even want to listen to, but I had it. <laughs> then I had the music that I really wanted. You know, like Zeppelin. You know, a gold disc that was pressed in London. Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. There was 18 pressings of this one CD. It was worth like $3,000. And I had so much of that. And I had to put it all inside of a garbage can with a half a gallon of gasoline. Almost burned my house down, true story. I burned as many as I could. The soot was getting so heavy, I had to stop. And then, then I met Lobby. And I just had all of these, I don't know, like 500 CDs still remaining in this one room full of just stuff. And one day we had a yard sale. I don't know, I made like this unbelievable amount of money from a yard sale. People coming into the house going, this is the coolest stuff ever. And we threw the rest of the CDs that didn't sell on the lawn. Cars were coming to a screeching stop, picking up CDs in front of my house. I had to get rid of it. I had to get out of my life. Why? It's a stumbling block. I'm going to hold on to this CD. It's, a, it, it's good music to backslide to. Right? I mean... <laughs> What are you going to hold on to it for? <laughs> and listen, and I had one of those, you know, I had a very rare printing of, of Ozzy Osbourne, Blizzard of Oz album. Again, one of 12. And I didn't want to get rid of it. I was like, no, 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 I'll just, I'll hold it there. That'll be fine. eBay was starting to come around. I eBayed it. Estimated $6,800. And I had to just take it and go on top of the pile. And I remember the guy that picked it up. He looked at it, he goes, oh, this has got to be fake, man. It's gold. And his friend goes, you're an idiot. Let me have that. <laughs> and they got in their car and drove away. But it had to leave my life. Now, I should have burned those too because it wasn't good in anybody else's hands either. <laughs> but... I just wanted it away from me. I didn't, I didn't need those idols in my life. Listen, gang, God honors that stuff. Whatever it is, the idols in your life. You know, I'm just being transparent with you. These are the things that had to go in my life. Things that I was still holding on to. But you know what? Then I had to just strip myself of all of it and say, man, I don't need any of it. I don't need any of it. I want to take God at his word. And God, if, if, if you're all I need, that's good because you're all I have. And I look at the faith of Jonathan. Gang, it, it really challenges me in my own walk with my own faith. Can I be a Jonathan? I'd like to believe I am. I'd like to believe that I can. But until we're in that place and we don't receive that measure of grace that we need from God, man, we just don't know. But I pray that we can all be Jonathans. Some of you need to, man, go back. The enemy has stolen your families, your children. Some of you have children or grandchildren that are headed to hell. And, and I want to be really, really careful because I know it's painful for some of you or all of you. But what are you doing about it? No, I'm not saying, oh, I'll go get Pastor Mike or Isaiah or Pastor Matt or, or Pastor Carl and I'll let them talk to, you know, my daughter, my son, my nephew. No, no, I'm asking, what are you doing about it? Jonathan didn't make it known to anybody else why he was going to handle the situation by himself. I'll do this. I don't need my daddy. What, what, are we, what are we doing? You see somebody going to hell that you love. Well, I don't want to offend them. So we don't offend them right into hell? 
You're chosen. In you is the heart of the living God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're afraid of offending somebody because you love them? Gang, listen to me. I think when the Lord has to wipe away tears from our eyes, I think that's going to be part of the reason. We'll realize how much we missed out on. How many opportunities we had and we just let them go because I just want to get along with them. Well, gang, that can never be the reason. You were saved, set apart, put on a mission in a mission field. Go and make disciples. Sometimes those disciples are in your own family. Sometimes they're your sister's kids or your brother's kids. Yeah, but my brother's not saved either. So that's why his son's not. Well, do you love your nephew? Of course. Then go talk to him. Go talk to him. Today we have all kinds of method of communication. Choose one. Because listen, there are Philistines out in that field destroying. Sometimes we need to get into the camp of the Philistine. And we need to fight. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, I wish the Lord had given us more information about this. He doesn't. Verse 15, and there was trembling in the camp. What does that mean? I try to research this the best I can. You know what I come up with? There was trembling in the camp. <laughs> so I don't know if, if that just means they were knock need, you know? It's possible. If there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. Now that's when you know the Spirit of God is working. The garrison and the raiders also trembled. When do the raiders tremble? I'm not talking about the football fan, uh, the football team, but you ever see the football team's fans? Raider fans are nuts. They're out of their minds. So you can imagine how much, how crazy Philistine Raiders are. I'm a fan of the Philistine Raiders. <laughs> they also trembled. And listen, the earth quaked. So not just the people, not just the animals. <laughs> now the earth can't even take it. So it was a very great trembling. Now, you want my insight? <clears throat> no? What do you mean, no? No, listen. Here's, here's my opinion. Why is the land trembling? I believe, and you'll see when you get to heaven that I was right. I believe the Lord was laughing. Why? It says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now, everybody gets that verse mixed up, messed up. You, you even have some commentaries that just jack that verse up. You want to know what that, that verse means? It's not the joy of the Lord strengthens me. It's when I am strengthened in faith and act out on it, it pleases my heavenly Father. Do you understand? In turn, the joy of the Lord is now my strength. Got it? Faith builds. Why? It's a gift from God. Faith is a gift. When you exercise faith, like a muscle in your body, it grows. Your faith grows because the joy of the Lord. I simply think that the Lord was just laughing, laughing at the, at the faith of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Ha, 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 ha. And the earth is trembling. Even the earth is going, why are you laughing? <laughs> just my opinion. Now, the watchmen of Saul in Gibeah, of Benjamin, they looked and there was the multitude melting away. And they went here and there and then Saul said to the people, 
who were with him, call the roll and, and see what, who's gone out from us. Why? He sees a battle going on. He sees this uproar. He hears the trembling, the shaking. He goes, well, who's fighting against the Philistines? Call a roll call. See who's missing from here. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Why surprisingly? Didn't tell his dad. His dad didn't know about it. And Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here. We're doing this again? Isn't this what happened the last time? When some idiot brought the ark and you lost it to the Philistines? I guess he didn't know about the Eli story. For at that time, the ark of God was with the children of Israel. And we knew we read about that already a few chapters ago. Now it happened while Saul talked to the priest that the noise of the camp of uh, um, the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. It's getting louder and louder. In other words, people are screaming because they're dying. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. In other words, forget about it. Leave the ark over there. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to the battle. And indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor, and there was a very great confusion. I pause. Here we go again. Remember Gideon? It was at night. The, the, the enemies of God, they started attacking each other in the night. This is an even greater miracle. Why? It's daytime. These guys are so confused, they're killing each other. It's like Jonathan and his armor bearer just standing there going, look at these morons. And they're just taking each other out. Now Israel's on foot. The army of Israel's coming. Now listen. Moreover, verse 21, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp surrounding uh, county or country, they also joined. What's that? All of those towns and, and, and little areas, these outposts that felt that, man, we got to join the Philistines because Israel's not defending us. Uh, we'll just become their slaves, I guess, and do what they call us to do. Now they're fighting against the Philistines. Why? They're seeing what's happening. God's on the move. Israeli's armies are coming. The, the Israeli army is coming. Let's go. They join the battle. And the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan, listen, likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in the battle. I pause. Listen, faith is incredibly contagious. When you see a leader, people get behind that. That's what happened with, uh, with 45. People saw that and said, wait a minute, this guy loves Israel. He doesn't back down. Man, I can get behind a guy like that. I thought this guy was just some goofball real estate billionaire, but obviously he's got a brain and he's doing something. And that's, that's the reason why this country had this this love for him. Uh, and now when you compare just a short time later, my goodness, uh, 46 is making 45 look like the greatest president we've ever had in this nation. I mean, because if you're doing the comparison, likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim when they heard the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, uh, and the battle shifted to Beth Evan. That is about, about five miles away. Uh, it left the area of Michmash, and now it's headed out about five miles. By the time they're done, they will drive them 15 miles away. Uh, an incredible battle. But listen, verse 24, it, it starts to get uh, stupid. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. Now all the people of the land came to a forest. 
and there was honey on the ground. And when the people had come into the woods, there was the honey dripping. But no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. This is not an oath of God. This is an oath of Saul. Why? Stupid pride. Arrogance. Entitlement. These are my enemies. No, they're not, you idiot. They're God's enemies. They're God's enemies. And you're holding the people to an oath that God never commanded you to do. And you don't hold people to an oath. You're not the priest. Only the priest calls a fast like this. And you have, you have men who are battling. Men who are battling get hungry. They need food. This is what happens right now with, with Russia. Russia thought that their, their war would be over by now. Their guys are starving. Again, breaking into supermarkets, breaking into homes, eating whatever they can because Russia's not supplying food to them. Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. They feared the oath, but Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with an oath. Therefore, he stretched out his uh, end of the rod that was in his hand and he dipped it in the honeycomb and he put his hand to his mouth and his countenance brightened. I bet, all sugared up. <laughs> then one of the people said, uh, your father strictly charged the people with a note saying, cursed is the man who eats the food this day. And all the people were faint. But Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. In other words, modern day vernacular, my father did what? My father doesn't have the ability to do this. Why would, he, why, would he, why would he trouble the land like this? In other words, why would he pronounce a curse on his own people? He's out of line. Look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little bit of this honey. A little a bit of honey. Remember a bit of honey? <laughs> they used to get stuck in your teeth, but man, they were good. That'll brighten your day. My sister used to keep bit of honey inside her purse, and she didn't know that I knew that, and I would steal it. I, I, was, I was only like 27. <laughs> How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found? For now there would not have been much, uh, wouldn't there be a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? You know, in other words, this could have been a, a much greater victory. Look at the army, man. They're beaten down. They're hungry, weakened. And listen, <laughs> the Christian is to be ready for battle, spiritual battle, always. And how do we prepare for spiritual battle? We're doing it right now. It's my job to feed you the Word of God, to teach you the Word of God so that you'll be nourished, strengthened, so that when you go home and you look at this again, you start praying, God then increases your faith and makes you ready for battle. That's how this works. That's the reason we do this. Why? Because God has told us to do this. Meditate on the word day and night. And in it, listen, you're going to find success. You're going to have success. You're going to walk in success. Not name it and claim it, <clears throat> but success nonetheless. Feed the people for battle. Verse, verse 31. Now they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to uh, Ajalon. So the people were very faint. And the people rushed on the spoil. I pause. Now they've driven them out of Israeli land and territory. Now for them, the battle's over. They did their job. Can we eat now? Now you can eat. Now they go to take the spoil. But look what happens. So the people were very faint. The people rushed on the spoil. They took sheep, oxen, calves, and they slaughtered them on the ground. And the people ate them with the blood. And I pause. That doesn't mean that they hacked up, you know, an ox. Oh, it started devouring it. That's not what that means. It means that they would take the animal, they'd cut the animal, they'd throw it on a fire and cook it, 
without bleeding the animal. Jewish law said you had to bleed out the animal first. When the animal stopped dripping to a certain amount of time pattern, you knew it was bled enough. Now you can put it on the fire, cook it, and eat it. So what they were doing is they were having medium rare steaks. That's what they were doing, which is not allowed in Jewish law. You're saying, well, I'm glad I'm not a Jew. I hear you. I hear you. But they were Jews. Uh, this, was a, this was a sin to do. <clears throat> now, verse 33. Then they told Saul, saying, look, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. So he said, you have dealt treacherously. Roll a large stone to me this day. In other words, somebody kill me. This guy's just a complainer, a grumbler, a complainer. He doesn't take charge. He's not a good leader. Then Saul said, disperse yourselves among uh, the people and say to them, bring me here every man's ox and every man's sheep, slaughter them here and eat. Do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. So every one of the people brought his ox with him that night. They slaughtered it. They slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. This was the first altar that he had built to the Lord. What's that mean? It means he's been walking long enough that he should have built many altars. He can be an altar builder. He cannot be the one who performs the sacrifice or offers sacrifice to God. He's not a priest. He says they're sinning. No, no, your sin is greater. Your sin, Saul, is greater. You're sinning against the Lord by working outside of your, uh, your lines. <clears throat> and listen, God is done with Saul. God's not judging him on the spot because God's already judged him. He's going to be king for another 30 years. He'll have no success. He'll make one mistake after another, and then he'll die on a battlefield. But God already said, let him know I'm replacing him. He's done. I'm going to replace him with someone, a man after my own heart. And David is that man. Now listen. Saul built an altar to the Lord. This was the first one, right? So in other words, he, he's not a man of the Lord. It says, oh, so we're not, sinning, we're not sinning against the Lord. He doesn't care about that. He's just trying to be the most important man in the place. He's trying to be the big shot. He calls the shots. He tells everybody when they should worship and how they worship and, and when they're going to give a, an offering. And he's going to do it all. He'll be the priest. He'll be the prophet. He'll be the king. And nobody's going to tell him otherwise. Now Saul said, let us go down to the Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light. And let us not leave a man of them. <laughs> now all the people said, do whatever seems good to you. The people have eaten. They don't care. It's almost like saying, yeah, whatever. Whatever, dude. But look at the next line. I find it interesting. Then the priest said, this is a hija or a, a, a jija. A jaya. Easy for you to say. Let us draw near to God here. <laughs> He said, no, no, listen, before we go down, can we just pray? I think we better start seeking the Lord here. I don't think what we're doing here is the, is the right thing. It should have been a hija to offer the sacrifice. But he usurps his authority and does it himself. Gang, there's a lot of lessons in that for all of us. For all of us. We ought to listen to that. God cares. They said, do whatever seems good to you. Verse 37, so Saul asked counsel of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he, that's God, did not answer him that day. And Saul said, come, uh, come over here, all you chiefs of the people, and know and see uh, what this sin was today. For as the Lord lives, who saves Israel, though it be uh, in Jonathan, my son, he shall surely die. He already knows it was Jonathan. But not a man among you, uh, of all the people, answered him. Uh, but not a man among all the people answered him. Nobody gave up Jonathan. Then he said to all of Israel, You be on one side, and my son Jonathan and I will be on the other side. 
And the people said to Saul, do whatever seems good to you, whatever. Therefore, Saul said to the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot. So Saul and Jonathan were taken. Again, we're not going to get into drawing lots because we really don't know what that is. Let's just say they rolled the dice. They rolled the dice to see who was the guilty one. And Saul and Jonathan were separated as, well, between you two, you're guilty. But the people escaped. And Saul said, cast lots between my son Jonathan and me. So Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you've done. And Jonathan told him and said, um, I only tasted a little bit of honey uh, with the end of the rod that was in my hand. So now I must die? Saul answered, God do so and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. There's a jealousy here. He's jealous of Jonathan. He's jealous that the people love Jonathan because of his bravery. Bravery that he doesn't have. Character that he doesn't have. And, uh, and it's almost like he hates his son. So he's going to use this excuse to kill him. But the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die? Who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground. Now we have the division. For he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not die. Uh, but wait, isn't this the king that you guys wanted? <laughs> right? To get behind him? Well, Then Saul returned from the pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. Philistines go to their own place, and ultimately King David is going to deal with the Philistines, uh, finally, and be done with them. Um, Saul in the next chapter is really going to mess up. Uh, and we'll, we'll see more of that next week. Um, so Saul established his sovereignty over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab and against the people of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, uh, against the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he harassed them. And he gathered an army and attacked the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. Now the Holy Spirit tells us that the sons of Saul were Jonathan, uh, Jishui, um, uh, Malchishua. <laughs> and the names of his two daughters uh, were these. The name of the firstborn was Merab, and the name of the younger was Mishal. The name of Saul's wife was Anahom, Ananom, uh, and the daughter of Ahimaaz, or Ahimaaz, Ahimaaz. And the name of the commander of his army was Abner, the son of Ner. That's deep. Abner, Ab, like in Abba, means father. Abner means the father of Ner. What's your son's name? Ner. Can't make this stuff up. It was Saul's uncle. Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner was the father of Abner. Uh, he was the son of Abiel. Now there was a fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him for himself. Now you'll notice from this uh, list, and we're going to have to talk about this because these guys are going to show up. You have a few names that are not mentioned of the sons. Um, Abinadab, uh, Eshelam, Armani, and finally Mephibosheth. They're not mentioned, and why? Well, they come from another line, another woman, and Mephibosheth and, uh, and his brother uh, were from Rizpah, and she was a concubine. Um, not mentioned here. Mentioned in other scripture, just not mentioned here uh, in 1 Samuel. So uh, we're going to stop there for the night. Gang, take this back and read it again and look at the faith of Jonathan and claim some of that faith for yourself. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for loving us and 
caring for us, Lord, and leading us, Lord, and filling us. Lord, please don't ever stop. (laughs) Don't ever stop, Lord. And Lord, like that song goes, Lord, please don't stop the madness. So many of us want the madness in our lives, the pace of our lives, the, the issues in life to stop. You know what, Lord? Don't stop it. Because it's that madness that keeps us on our knees. It keeps us begging for you and needing your help. Lord, and maybe I'm only speaking for myself. I thank you for all the issues I have, every problem I have, every tooth that needs work, Lord, every asthma attack. Lord, I thank you for everything, God. It keeps me on my knees, Lord. I thank you for every brother and sister in this place, Lord. I thank you for all those that watched online tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.